In this video, what I'm going to be doing is actually going over some new news, gameplay details, and just miscellaneous information for the Outer Worlds. In the weeks following E3, a lot of interviews have started to surface, in particular over the past 5 or 6 days or so, going over a lot of interesting things, such as some of the different difficulty modes, the various endings the Outer Worlds will feature. I've read through several of the more recent interviews and compiled many of those details into this video, although if you want to see the original sources, I will have links to everything I talk about down below. Just speaking more broadly, over the next couple of months, there should be a lot of interesting or otherwise cool things coming out on this channel for the Outer Worlds if you guys do want to subscribe. But otherwise, starting things off, a very important disclaimer for those of you that maybe aren't super keen on the fact that the Outer Worlds is getting Epic Games exclusivity, at least kind of. Following the announcement of the Outer Worlds, it had a very positive PR run. And for those first few months, it was pretty much just positivity. But once news broke that the Outer Worlds would be an Epic Games Store exclusive for the first year, that did definitely shift the tide a little bit and made a lot of people pretty unhappy. In reality, that's not totally true. Yes, it is going to be on the Epic Game Store and not on Steam, at least for the first year, but it's also being served on the Microsoft Store in case you want to buy it that way. Or, as we recently found out, even if you don't want to buy it that way, if you're just a member of the Xbox Game Pass. Obsidian, the developer behind the Outer Worlds, was recently purchased by Microsoft, and following E3, it was actually announced that the Outer Worlds would be a part of Xbox Game Pass from day one. So the day this game comes out, out on October 25th, you can play it as long as you have Xbox Game Pass, which again only runs you around $10 per month. But even further, there's often a lot of promotion. You could probably get a free trial if you technically wanted to just try out the game for like a week. But either way, the reason I mention this is if you're one of those people particularly unhappy about the game being an Epic Game Store exclusive, kind of, this certainly seems like a pretty nice alternative. It's still not going to be on Steam, at least for the first year, but being able to just pay $10 for the first month and actually gain access to it, even if just to try it out, is a pretty good deal. Outside of that, actually looking at some details around the game itself through some of these various interviews, one of the first major topics to be discussed was actually about endings and choice in the game. As reportedly, there's going to be two or maybe even slightly more major endings or paths you could take in the Outer Worlds. So in essence, you're going to have two major options, either decide with Phineas, the guy that actually breaks you out of your crypto sleep, or the board who set up these space colonies that you can find yourself on. These are two parties at opposing ends, so you could choose to side with one or the other, or to side with one for a little while, then backstab him and go to the other. Or even from one of the interviews, it's described how you could almost backstab both of them and kind of go for a more lone wolf style of playthrough. But either way, as far as it comes to with the major endings of the game, there's two major divisions, either siding with the board or siding with Phineas. And although at first that might sound concerning to you, being like, hey, I thought this was a very choice-focused game and only two endings sounds fairly minimal, it seems like that's just kind of on the more big picture stuff as to who kind of wins in the end, per se. This game will feature ending slides, pretty similar to what we saw in Fall at New Vegas. So after getting the major slide for whether Phineas or the board ends, you'll actually see other slides that talk about your actions you took throughout the game as well as some of your various consequences, but even other things that sound pretty interesting, like the various people you encountered, the different areas you entered, how you solved certain quests and what that means for the future of that particular colony. And despite the two major paths, it seems like there's actually going to be a lot of variation in how the game can end and what exactly transpires after you beat the game. Which speaking of, it's also described how you apparently could pretty much be the antagonist of the Outer Worlds, make certain decisions that paint you as the villain of the game, and this will reportedly have drastic impacts on the story and some of the story outcomes. It's not really clear if that just means siding with the board, if that's like the evil root and you being the antagonist, or if perhaps there are ways to even go a step beyond that. You don't just side with the board, but maybe you even try and ruin things for the board and just everyone in general. Outside of that, one of the other things they do talk more about is difficulties in this game, and this actually has me particularly excited. It'll have the typical stuff like easy, normal, or hard difficulties, like pretty much every game, but two other ones that are a little bit less traditional. A story mode difficulty that's going to make it very easy to get through some of the combat or kind of remove the combat aspect to a certain degree. It's not clear if that just means making it stupidly easy that anyone can do it or actually taking out certain parts. But either way, that mode's for those of you that just want to experience the story. Probably really useful on subsequent playthroughs when trying to get through some of the various outcomes or consequences this game will have. But outside of just the story mode, you also will have the supernova mode, which will be the hardest difficulty 
and come with some pretty big twists on gameplay. In Supernova, you'll have things like permadeath companions. We've heard about this in the past, but on this hardest difficulty, your companions can die forever. It's not totally clear how easy or hard this is to occur. You have to imagine it's not just their health bar going all the way down once, because that seems like it'd be a little bit too common. But even outside of that, as far as emphasizing that consequence, you're also not going to have the option to not take flaws. So if you don't know, flaws in the outer worlds are basically things that will occur naturally as you play the game. Like let's say just one too many times you get shot in the head, you might actually be able to take a concussion flaw. You'll just randomly get this prompt on screen while playing the game. And the way it works is you could take the flaw and you will have a debuff to your character. Like let's say maybe headshots do extra damage or your intelligence is permanently lowered, but you will get to take an extra perk, which is described as being very valuable. For the supernova difficulty, we know of a couple of things. First and foremost, the amount of flaws you can take overall is greater, so you can take more flaws. But even further, again, you won't have a choice. When a flaw pops up, you have to take it. That is now a permanent altercation to your character. If you get attacked by robots or damaged too heavily by robots too many times, you'll have a permanent debuff to robots while also getting to take an extra perk. In one interview, a concussion flaw is described. This is naturally from taking too much head damage, and it basically will force you into a dumb character. It'll lower your intelligence, give you new dumb dialogue options. You alternatively could get these just by specking your character out with low intelligence. But naturally, you could see how this could have a pretty massive impact on that hardest difficulty and really transform the outcomes you have as a result of it. Some of the other name flaws are things like a fear of heights, robots, and even the dark. And one other thing described out flaws more broadly, for the most part, they're just going to be system-based. They're going to bring buffs or debuffs to your character. It's not really going to be as much of a story component, but sometimes they actually will be. And it's described how if you have a robot flaw, on occasion, when speaking to robot NPCs, you'll have the option to just scream in their face which I just love that. One of the other things actually described on the supernova difficulty is that you could actually only use certain consumables on your ship. So it's not like you could just use them wide open in the wild, but you'll be restricted in the locations. That's all we know right now, but you have to imagine there might be a few other twists associated with this mode once we actually get to play it. And personally, I'm really, really excited for this. I love playing Fallout games on that super hardcore mode where you one-shot enemies and they could pretty much one-shot you also. It really changes up the gameplay. It makes the game feel just significantly different. And it sounds like to some degree, the Supernova mode will have a similar effect, although through different means. Although speaking more about those companions and really the reactivity of this world, even though yes, your companions could permanently die and you can permanently lose access to their quests on Supernova, even in some of the lower difficulties, if you make the wrong choices or fail various checks, you can piss off your companions to the point of them leaving you. This will also make you lose access to some of their quests or the story elements associated with them. But in this new interview, it's also described how the games writer was pretty sure that there's still a feature where you could actually piss them off to the point of attacking you. This would probably require you to actually fail some kind of check. It wouldn't just naturally happen. It'd be like a step more. Maybe you need to attempt to appease them, but you fail the speech check, then they're extra pissed off and will actually attack you. But that's pretty cool. I really like how in this game, there's an emphasis on how companions can really aid your character, aid your playthrough. You can take leadership skills and enhance your companions' abilities that way, but you'd also have a lot of consequence if you don't tend to those relationships, or at the very least, keep them in mind while making major decisions. Which, speaking of, that actually doesn't just apply to companions. Outside of that, it's also described how certain characters will react to your past and current actions. Let's say you kill a certain NPC's best friend, they will notice and they will change their attitude towards you as a result. Also, it's described how, let's say you're running around naked, the NPCs will call you out on that and be like, hey, what are, you, what are you doing, bud? I don't actually know if they'll say that exactly, but you get the idea. And even the iconic that if you kill somebody in a town, the guards of the town will end up going hostile towards you. Those are just a couple of examples, but it seems like there are several things you can do, wear, or even say in game that will lead to consequences with the NPCs. Although, apparently, even even more broadly, you'll have certain choices like this while encountering some of the various corporations. In all likelihood, it'll probably happen in an NPC level. You'll interact with the heads of the corporations, and then you can choose which ones you kind of want to help out or side with, or the ones you want to turn against. It's not totally clear how much of an impact this will have or how kind of deep you could get in this, but overall, a lot of the corporations are described as different shades of gray. Not that there'll be a clear cut, oh, this is the good one and this is the bad one, but this is bad for this reason, or this is good for this reason, and you have to kind of 
pick and choose which ones you're interested in. Or I suppose you could just not and hate all of them. One thing described really broadly about this game that you could probably kind of infer from the rest of what I've said in this video is that it's not going to be tightly choreographed, meaning that every interaction, every encounter isn't going to be following a super, super strict script, but since you have so many options as a player, there are many different paths you can take here. The interactions you have can go several different ways. This is mainly as a commentary on some of the certain features that have maybe gotten a little bit of criticism. One of the heads on this game actually mentions how a lot of people have been saying the shooting didn't look super good in some of the gameplay, but that that's probably just part of the videos and that actually experiencing it in the game, he thinks people will be more impressed with it, or at least from those actually playing the game, that's more of their reaction. Even further, one of the other major things to be critiqued was the facial animations. It's described that due to the size and budget behind this game, they couldn't do facial capture that many games are doing right now, so they are kind of limited, that's why it kind of looks a little bit more old school, but actually responding to some of that feedback, they are presently working on touching up some of the facial animations to hopefully make them look a bit better. And yeah, that's a pretty good overview of some of the more recent information or details we got around the Outer Worlds. I feel like every time I make one of these videos, I just get a little bit more excited for this game. I think it's going to be one of those pure and true RPG experiences. The game you play, and then want to replay and replay again, and then a few years down the line you're like, oh yeah, why don't I go do another playthrough of the Outer Worlds? It just seems like there's so many different branches, so many different paths you can take, and I'm really excited to see how that all interacts or comes together. But also, I'm excited to see where this game goes next. This could be the starting of a very successful franchise and one of those franchises that has that true-to-form RPG mechanics and elements and one that you look forward to in years to come. Either way, hopefully you guys enjoyed this one, hopefully you found it informative. Again, links to everything I talked about down below. But until then, I thank you again for watching, and I hope to see you all next time. Later.